Okay, um, I'll begin by saying um, I'm Sue Eckhind from the Eastman Cares uh, Education Committee. Um, this is the 12th and last of our um, session, uh, our COVID seminar series, our COVID-19 seminar series to be exact, um, that we began last November. Um, it's been, uh, I think, a really interesting um, journey. And I think we've had some wonderful, wonderful speakers um, and provided hopefully an opportunity for the Eastman community um, to, to be educated and to learn more about um, what we were living through and are still living through, but at least things are improving. Um, and so I wanna thank everyone who is here. Um, this is, uh, as I said earlier, um, the type of webinar where there is no video for participants um, and there's no audio for participants. However, that being said, um, you will have opportunities throughout, and Paul will stop a couple times throughout his talk to um, ask questions. So whenever a question occurs to you, if you would put it in the Q&A, um, on the computer that's down the bottom of the screen. Um, on some other devices, it's on the top. Um, but if you could use that instead of, for example, the chat, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to sort of monitor the questions as we go along. So um, I would appreciate that. Um, I always have to begin by giving a plug for Eastman Cares, their local community resource guide. Um, this was updated last October, um, and it's a very helpful um, document. Um, if you need um, resources relate, relating to care, um, this is really very comprehensive, and it is checked uh, to be sure that it's still up to date. Um, it's available both online, um, and it is also through the Eastman website, and it's also available at South Cove. So if you or need it or you know someone who needs it, please pick one up. Um, the other thing that eCare has going on is we have a eCare's Connections, which is an opportunity for people who would like a daily check-in, a weekly check-in, a monthly call, um, either for yourself or if you know someone else who might be interested in that. We do have volunteers who are willing to do that service. So if you are interested in that, um, or know someone who you might want to refer is Eastman Cares at eastmannh.org. Um, and relative to that, because uh, this is relative to that website, because this is the last of our um, webinars, um, we're taking a break for the summer. Um, so we are interested though in either or both your evaluation of what you thought of um, the COVID-19 seminar series and any other suggestions that you might have for programs that we, we might want to do when we resume, um, presumably in the fall. Um, whether we'll resume with our lunch and learns and cookies and whatever, um, or whether we'll still be on Zoom, it's too soon to actually answer that yet. But we would appreciate any feedback um, that you all have. Uh, just a note to say, in case you didn't know, um, this is being recorded and it will be, uh, it's a YouTube recording um, Eastman site and you can find actually all the talks um, are recorded um, on uh, Eastman Cares website. So feel free to, to go to those if you missed one and you'd like to, uh, and you'd like to hear it. Um, that's a service I think that Lori has provided that we really appreciate. Um, and I think, let's see, uh, I guess I can introduce Paul. So again, if you have feedback um, relative to the evaluations of our seminar series or for suggestions for next year, it's the same, um, the same link, Eastman Cares at EastmanNH.org. Okay. So now I can introduce Paul. Oh, before I introduce Paul, actually, I do want to say that um, Paul is teaching another course at um, 130. So um, I hope there will be plenty of opportunities for questions. But if he does have to leave, that's, uh, that's the reason why. I would assume you have to leave about 115, Paul, 120? About 115, 120, yeah. Okay. 
All right. So that being said, let me introduce um, Dr. Paul Atkind, who is an epidemiologist. He's a retired public health epidemiologist. Although I don't really feel like he's been retired much lately, but anyway, um, his career was focused and concentrated on infectious disease control at the local, in Nashua actually, at the state um, for Massachusetts and at the national level for the National Association of City and County Health Officials. So um, he's been very involved in the, actually our last three speakers have been part of, have been the um, Eastman Healthcare Advisory Team um, meeting every week to be sure that we can figure out how to best protect us throughout this pandemic. Um, so he's been very involved in all these issues. And he has an interesting question to try to answer, given that it changes like practically every day. What will the post-COVID world look like? Uh, Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Sue. And uh, thanks for everybody who is uh, on board today. Uh, so let me bring up my slides and... Okay. Okay, so this is the this is the bug. This is the coronavirus, and let's see. Um, there we go. Okay. Alrighty. So. Um, we're going to talk about how do plague come to an end, and then what will the post-COVID world look like? And I'll, I'll give you a hint, uh, as as is uh, a famous line from uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia: "Nothing is written." So, question is, when does a pandemic end? And a pandemic can end, depending upon your orientation, it could end uh, through epidemiologic and quantitative uh, measures, uh, it can end through biologic outcomes or social measures. I'm just wondering, do you see what's on top? Okay, you are screen share. All right, so, uh, one way to measure uh, is whether or not new cases and deaths in an area in a span of time, are they, are they decreasing? Uh, where is the outbreak now having the least impact? Uh, so which areas are seeing the least number of recent cases and deaths relative to the population size? Uh, where might outbreaks be declining? Uh, how fast are the cases and deaths decreasing, decreasing over time? And in which portions of the population are they decreasing? So this is, um, there we go. And where's the good news coming from? Uh, which areas are seeing the greatest case, hospitalization and deaths uh, declined by, uh, by rate? And where is the lowest effective reproductive rate, meaning uh, how many cases are generated by being in contact with a previous case? And if the rate is less than one, uh, each case is resulting in less than one case each, and you are on your way towards ending, ending your, uh, your plague in your area. So there are biological ways of ending a, a pandemic. Uh, they, they can appear to end with continued imposition of non-pharmaceutical intervention. These place strong pressure against viral transmission and we've really been able to measure this much better uh, in, this, uh, in this pandemic than in previous pandemics. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen that as soon as the, these non-pharmaceutical interventions, the, the masks, social distancing, et cetera, are relaxed, we have unfortunately seen the transmission begins to recur and comes back roaringly. Uh, I think the virus is probably still gonna be with us no matter what. We are not going to eradicate this virus. It may continue to circulate at some low and steady level. 
And this relates to something called herd immunity. And uh, perhaps you saw in today's Valley News, a column uh, on the, uh, the opinion page uh, that uh, herd immunity is, is probably an unattainable uh, state of affairs. Um, but herd immunity is when there is enough of the population that has either been immunized or has had the illness and thus has antibody naturally formed, uh, that th there's going to be difficulty in the virus finding susceptible people. So the virus is going to have a more difficult time reestablishing itself at any great levels. Uh, and if we approach herd immunity via illness and vaccinations, um, that, that is really the goal, but it's not clear if this is even possible. And just running some of the numbers, uh, the, the level of, of immunity that is supposed to reach herd immunity was, has been estimated as 70%. But 30% through consistent surveys of different par portions of the population, we keep seeing that 30% of the population in America is not willing to get a vaccine and to be immunized. So we're already down to a maximum level of 70%. Uh, right now, one quarter of our population is uh, under 18 years of age. And we have just had the, the good news that a vaccine has been licensed that's uh, gonna be appropriate for uh, people 12 to 17 years of age. So we can begin to approach that population. And I know there's gonna be strong efforts to try to immunize that population prior to the September school opening. Uh, but how many will be vaccinated? How many school systems will mandate vaccination? Uh, and how many parents are gonna hold off feeling that, uh, well, I want to see how it's going to, you know, how it's going to affect other kids first uh, before I subject mine uh, or allow my son, my my son or daughter to be, uh, you know, part of this um, experiment, which it is not. Uh, and then we also have a small portion of the population who are, because of underlying illnesses, are receiving medications that compromise their immunity and their ability to mount an immune response. And so it's not clear if folks with HIV or cancers, or, or like I should put it that all folks with HIV and all folks with cancer, all folks who are taking immunosuppressive drugs for their respective conditions will mount a sufficient antibody uh, response. So I, you know, this, this idea of a herd immunity is, is um, probably something that's that's better for a fixed population. But for a population with open borders, um, with people coming from other parts of the world where there's not as uh, vigorous an immunization effort, uh, and perhaps not, not necessarily due to, uh, you know, missteps on their end, uh, just vaccine is unaffordable, or vaccine supplies are unavailable. Uh, so, it's going to take a while before a significant portion of the world's population has been immunized. From a Darwinian ex uh, perspective, it's not in the interest of the pathogen to kill its victim. Uh, a swift death prevents further transmission to new cases and to new life for the virus. So we've seen that pathogens usually become less lethal over time. Milder strains are favored in this scenario. And if you recall the SARS-CoV-1, which uh, I think emerged in 2003, never really attained pandemic status because it was, it was uh, too much of a killer. And so too many people died too quickly for them to be able to transmit to other people. So there are, uh, we are seeing new variants coming out with the SARS-CoV-2, which is the, the, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. But some seem to be more pathogenic, uh, which means that they're more easily transmissible from person to person. And some uh, appear to be more virulent, meaning that they produce more severe disease. At some point, we may or will begin to see 
an increasing proportion of variants that are more pathogenic, meaning more transmissible, yet less virulent. This is from a, as I said, from a Darwinian uh, point of view, uh, this is what's best for the virus. But there's also a social end to, to epidemics or pandemics uh, where fear, anxiety, and socioeconomic disruption uh, begins to, to reduce. Uh, pandemics always take on social value. We always uh, attach our enemies' names to them. Uh, the Russian flu of 1890s, Kung flu uh, of the, the COVID-19, et cetera. And we place artificial values on our prevention strategies. Masks, if you wear them, you were thought to be virtuous. If you didn't wear them, you were thought to be a freedom lover. Uh, social distancing, if you followed it, you were, you were considered to be virtuous. Again, if you didn't follow it, you thought you were thought to be a freedom lover. You know, we view situations through our respective lenses. So if you look at the schools, parents, especially the frontliner parents who had difficulties trying to stay home with their children during lockdown, they want their kids to go to schools and there are very good reasons for their children to be in school in person. However, from the teacher's point of view, the teacher's unions were concerned with their members' health. And in their mind, in-person classes were not a good idea. You had two very legitimate sets of reasonable concerns and they were at loggerheads with each other. And that's gonna happen. So those closer to the bottom of the socioeconomic status uh, ladder, if you will, or scale, uh, or with less social capital, uh, such as elders, the poor, folk who are in prison, chronically ill, socially marginalized, they're probably gonna continue to see illness and death even after the rest of society is either no longer affected or affected to a much lesser degree. Thus, you may have some parts of society who feel a pandemic is over, while others feel that they're in the bullseye of a raging disease target. The socio-political processes are more powerful than data in helping to determine if a pandemic or plague has ended. Uh, look at our response to mass shootings suicides, tobacco illness and death, drug addiction, and so on. Now, unless we develop the political will to see problems through and to, to get them down to being manageable, perhaps not eradicating, but uh, ideally perhaps eliminating some, pro some of these problems, we develop a certain tolerance for some level of frequencies of these concerns. Um, acceptance, even in the presence of continuing illness or continued school shootings, whatever, reduces that sense of crisis. Whoops, okay, let's get this. So how do we end this, uh, this pandemic? Uh, very frankly, we've been hampered by a lack of a plan, no comprehensive approach, no leadership, disagreement on what's called for by data, versus what political ideology and economic data call for, and wishful thinking that's been devoid of scientific fluency. It's, uh, this, is, this pandemic has been a huge black eye for a, a group and a profession that was held up by the world as, as the finest in the world, and that's the US public health system. So, <laughs> This, this was interesting. This is probably the most data you're going to look at. Uh, on, the, uh, on the left uh, is, uh, look at the, these are six models that have been developed uh, or models by six institutions of what we expect to see uh, between now and, and September. So they looked at high vaccination with low uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, low vaccination and moderate non-pharmaceutical interventions, and low vaccination and low NPI. So on your left, uh, labeled number A, or labeled A, um, it's interesting because if you look at the reported cases uh, and the hospitalizations and the deaths, 
the if you have a situation of high vaccination and low NPI or low vaccination and moderate NPI, they're not that different. And that talks about the power, that speaks to the power of non-pharmaceutical interventions. On the, the right-hand part of A, uh, the deaths, you see uh, a much greater span uh, of possibilities uh, according to these, these um, models uh, when you're dealing with a situation of low vaccination and low NPI. Now, the B is a compilation of all of the states. So it's not the national level aggregated, but it's you put all of the states and you account for each individual state. Uh, and once again, high vaccination and low NPI, low vaccination and moderate NPI aren't all that different in their outcome. And once again, this really uh, hits home how powerful masks and social distancing can be. But if you look at the hospitalizations particularly and the deaths, those are much higher if you have low vaccination and low non-pharmaceutical intervention. So in a country where it has been 50 states and 50 plans, um, we are gonna see quite a bit of variability in the situations state by state. And so without the sort of federal standardization of what's happening, this is what we can look forward to, uh, that some states are gonna be doing much better than others. And uh, conversely, some states are gonna be looking at tragedy. So the question is, do we have the political will and the patience to really aggressively vaccinate? sustain our use of masks, social distancing and hand hygiene. And just yesterday, we got the CDC's announcement that uh, masks for vaccinated people are uh, no longer necessary in most situations. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of states are not delaying any opening up. Uh, they're not using their, their case metrics very much. Uh, they're just going to open up. Uh, we have been aggressively testing on the order of millions of tests per day, and that needs to continue. Uh, we have begun aggressive contact tracing, and that needs to continue. Uh, bans on gatherings and social mixing where and when appropriate. Uh, will employers redesign their workplaces? Will schools redesign their spaces? Um, and uh, our social service is gonna be available. Uh, you know, some things that if you are in a lockdown, this is difficult, meals in schools for many children in our nation, sad to say, uh, many of them are, uh, this is their only meal of the day, perhaps two meals, breakfast, and they get a hot lunch. Uh, people need childcare if they, if they expect to be able to go to work, especially if they're in a frontline uh, type of a position. Health insurance is also necessary. Um, so uh, this is, uh, are we willing to take on these, these sorts of expenses? It's gonna be difficult to achieve herd immunity. I already talked about the percentages that are not being vaccinated. The 25% the 20, the of the 18 and over is just, uh, is, is now, going to be approached, uh, but that 30% of the population that says no way, I, I'm not gonna be vaccinated, that is a huge problem. Uh, the 4% of the population is immune compromised. This is just sort of a fact. This is not a decision that they're making. Paul, well, could I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. There's a question. Would you just say what NPI means? Non-pharmaceutical intervention. Thank you. The masks, uh, you know, covering your coughs, covering your sneezes, uh, social distancing, hand washing, things like that. There are two others. Do you want to take them now or do you want to wait? Um, I think I'm almost at a, uh, give me just one moment. Then here's, okay. here's my first prediction. Uh, we are, I think we're going to continue to see localized outbreaks in cases occurring into 2022 at the least. And 
maybe our response is going to morph from a, you know, a nationwide vaccination program into a smallpox like ring immunization strategy. Now, small, just to explain that, if you're not familiar, smallpox was eradicated, is the only human uh, uh, disease that has been eradicated uh, from the world. And as they, they came to the end game, where there were, you know, little pockets of unimmunized people, and they would, they would become apparent when uh, a case would occur. And so there would be a, like a, uh, I hate to call it a SWAT team, but a, a rapid response team would go into that village or into that area. And they would make sure that everyone who might have been in contact with this person is then immunized, whether they've been immunized before or not. Uh, and if they certainly had no record of immunization, then they would be immunized. So every case was surrounded by a, a ring of immunized people. And ultimately that resulted in the, the end of smallpox. We went two years without a single case being reported anywhere in the world. And uh, the last case was in 1978. And in 1980, the World Health Organization declared for the first time ever and uh, it's still the first time ever, uh, a human disease has been eradicated from this world. But with that being said, we're still gonna need to see what the duration of vaccine-induced immunity is. We still need to see what the duration of natural infection immunity is. Will we need to continue to have vaccination programs? I think that this is gonna become a vaccine, just like uh, pertussis, tetanus, uh, measles, rubella, this is going to become part of our, our routine uh, immunization strategy. And we're going to need to be open to the possibility of variants arising that the vaccines will not protect against. And this is why it is so important that we do everything we can to try to immunize now, reduce the extent of transmission, and thus reduce the extent of the possibility of variant arising. I think there's maybe, yes. So the wild card is that the pandemic is not gonna end until it ends globally. So almost half of the countries in this world are either not immunizing, there are 14 of them, or they're just beginning to do so. There's 81 of those. Uh, the virus is still transmitting and still replicating. Uh, the possibility or threat of a pathogenic and virulent variant that is not susceptible to vaccines uh, would mean all of humanity will have to start this all over again. We all know the frequency and ease of global travel. We need to do what it takes to assure as much of our population as possible is immunized as swiftly as possible. And yes, it's a cliche, but it is very true. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Sue, can I, you want to throw the questions out? Sure. Oh, throw that way. Just tell me, ask me the question, please. The first one actually um, relates to how to find the videos on the website. So um, I have just actually gotten the answer to that from Lori um, and I'll send it out um, on the listserv. Um, so that uh, people will be able to get that. And I'll ask Lori to post it too with the last of these um, that she posts in highlights. Okay, um, Ken, well, I'm gonna start with Vivian actually. What do you think of the recent announcement about mass protocols from the CDC? Um, I, you know, they're, they're really focused on people who are immunized. Um, and, I, you know, I have some mix, mixed thoughts, but they've got, They've got uh, uh, good evidence from uh, published papers uh, that seems to be well done work. Um, I, I think we're, we're starting, and Ken, who's also on the, the health committee, uh, you know, we, we can attest to the conversation is more and more, not only here in Eastman, but also around the country, is we're going from uh, you know, for public health measures to, um, 
what what level here's what you can do to protect yourself and more and more of a, a personal choice in, of of what you're what you're willing to do um masks among immunized people outdoors i don't see a point to that unless you're in one of those exceptions like a, a large public gathering a concert or or uh, outdoor lecture or something like that um and uh but you know nobody's asking anybody and, and there's no policing it so you know if uh if you are a an, an under vaccinated or not vaccinated person, uh, I think that uh, you know nobody's going to know the difference, and that's kind of a problem. So it's it's not not much of a black and white answer, um, but certainly in many cases there's really no need for immunized, fully immunized people to be wearing masks. Thank you. This is from Ken. <clears throat> this is a novel virus now with a novel mRNA and other vaccines, which are highly effective at preventing morbidity as safety of vac vaccines continues to be established. And if lethality of SARS-2 COVID persists, might we not see yearly immunization for unvaccinated? Which at-risk population would be best vaccinated? Two questions, actually. It's, uh, I think part of the part, part of the answer lies in uh, what's the duration of immunity. Um, you know, I think that ultimately, I'm imagining that this would be a good thing to add to the, the list of, of vaccines that are necessary to enter into school or into daycare. Um, if we can immunize starting then, at that point, uh, then what we will learn in terms of vaccine-induced immunity and natural infection-induced immunity, I think we'll, we'll answer the second part of the question in terms of whether we need boosters or how frequently will we, will we need boosters. Um, this is a, a disease that affects everyone. So I, I don't think that there's a, a particular professional group uh, or uh, social group that would be at higher risk um, of infection outside of the, the disproportionate risks that different portions of our, our society endure. Um, but did I, did I make that clear? Um, I think it's, I think that the vaccine is going to be with us. It's going to become part of our our, our, our public health and social ecology. Okay. One more. Um, there's one from Bob and Carol Herrick that I'm going to save. They think for later in the presentation. And so it's a, I'll save that one. Um, Sue wants to know what countries are not immunizing and why? Uh, you know what? I can't give you a, a list. There are a couple of countries who feel that uh, uh, this is God's will, or at least the government says this is God's will. Um, most of the countries that are not immunizing either cannot afford any vaccine uh, or what they can afford is, is uh, way too small to have an impact yet on their population. So this, uh, this really heightens the, or illustrates the importance of you know, it's not just the United States. Uh, and I'm sorry if this is a political comment, but it's, it is a political comment. Uh, and I, I don't, I, I will stand by it. Um, the, 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 the America first, the, the nationalistic approach is not something that makes any sense in a pandemic. It, it really is. Everyone in the world needs to be protected and there needs to be an infrastructure to continue that level of protection if we are going to expect a, you know, no resumption of outbreak situation. Thank you. Okay. We'll say, we'll say the last one. Yep. Okay. So here's where I, I put on my, my, uh, uh, my, my uh, prediction hat. And uh, 
but let's see what goes on. All right, government. You know, our debate with government has been, oh, government's way too big. And on the other side of the ledger, government is way too small. Perhaps what we should do is shift that debate to what's the right size for government given what our needs are right now. We've had a glimpse of complete mismanagement. We're now seeing the enormous power of government when it's handled more appropriately. Vaccine distribution is happening. Economic aid is coming. Rental aid is coming. Healthcare insurance is being expanded in many places. Uh, our infrastructure, which is as much of a public health issue as, as any, uh, particularly the broadband aspect of infrastructure, is, is uh, th there are proposals to improve that. Uh, look at how much we depended on the trucking industry to make sure that we had what we needed. Uh, the roads, the bridges, uh, th that's the, the core of our infrastructure and education. Uh, those are either proposed or there's already money on the way. Uh, I will hope that we move away from ideology towards competence and what makes sense. And I, I think the 2022 elections are going to decide this for us. I, I really think that the stakes are huge. Government again. Uh, the COVID vet pandemic has called on people to make collective sacrifices. And the public needs to believe in the value of these sacrifices. If we request collective sacrifices, then I think there needs to be a social contract that says, if you do this, we will do that for you. We will protect you. To make this work, government needs to assume a more active role, which it's trying to do. And the public needs to accept this relationship with government. We certainly did during the Great Depression. You know, the new programs put out by, by FDR and the New Deal, um, people saw that this was in their best interest. Government had never taken on such an expansive role before, but it was, it was deemed reasonable at that time. I think we're at another time like that. I think public service, instead of being seen as a target, it needs to be an investment. So radical reforms, uh, you know, are we gonna go for healthcare for all? Will we look at expansion of Medicaid, Medicare? Will we support preschool education? And will we expand the school year? Because what we're finding in elementary school years uh, that the, the big divide between the poor and the, and the middle class and well-to-do happens during the summer when uh, the poor have very few opportunities for camp or summer school, et cetera. Um, and, and this is where the divide starts to occur. Uh, will we protect against climate change? Will we support low-income housing, et cetera? Will, a lot of questions about the privileges of the wealthy. Wealth, do we have wealth taxes, which is what's being proposed now? Uh, redistribution of wealth, which is being proposed now. Uh, do we reform election financing? I mean, all aspects of our society play a role in uh, the disproportionate impact on different parts of our, of our uh, population which affect everybody one way or another. Business. Uh, the pandemic has shown that we are very social animals. Working, you know, so many people work from home and we're finding, wow, this is great. Uh, you know, no commute. Uh, I've reduced my, many expenses um, and I've been as productive as ever. But the question that I have is, is this our future or are we only spending existing social capital? So people have gone into lockdown with aims that they've already known and that they have worked together with. But, you know, when it comes to teams, there are two factors that come into play with these work relationships. Communication, which is enhanced by proximity, and trust also increases with proximity and shared experiences. It is very difficult to create a sense of community and a culture of belonging while you're at a distance. It's even harder when employees have dramatically different home lives and may never even meet or have met the rest of their team. My sense is that initially we're gonna go back, we're gonna use a hybrid model for office work. 
but ultimately I think we're gonna be returning to the offices. Uh, if we find that um, the hybrid model is sufficient, create that, that team cohesion uh, and that cultural cohesion uh, that's necessary for businesses, then uh, maybe the hybrid model is what's gonna stick. What happens to the cities without home, uh, major home offices? Uh, I, th I think of, uh, you know, Boston, uh, New York, uh, so many corporations have their home offices there. But if they move out, the real estate market is gonna drop. The businesses that feed off of these businesses, the sandwich shop, the dry cleaning, uh, so many service businesses, they're gonna fail. And tax revenue is gonna go way down. Uh, there's a move of home offices, perhaps to the suburbs where it's less expensive. So uh, my understanding is Boston is now finding a way to rent much of the vacated downtown office buildings and they're redoing them as biotech lab. Well, I don't know if this is a, a national model. Is there enough of a biotech industry to uh, push in the fall in many cities, or is this the Boston solution? Uh, one thing's for sure that the pandemic has shown a business model based on people lining up for services is a loser. So ice cream stands, restaurants, retail, these are, these are ones that are having the toughest time dealing with a lockdown. So a uh, professor at the Harvard Business School said, business is screwed if we don't fix climate change. We've had a taste of less smog and less pollution. We've had less reliance on cars for commuting. Amazon, GM, VW have all announced they're only gonna be making and using electric cars by 2030, somewhere between 2030 and 2035. When you have three major corporations like this, you know that others are gonna follow. Uh, the infrastructure bill that's uh, being proposed right now is looking at major investments in wind, solar energy, and broadband. Coal is already recognized as being dead. Uh, big oil is seeing fewer opportunities to drill, and they're beginning to invest in green energy. And they're, they're actually, their lobbyists are now supporting the proposed carbon cap and trade legislation. So th there's major changes happening here. Uh, and we need to be watching and, and making sure they continue to go in the, uh, in the right direction. So again, will business stand up for frontline workers? So again, in today's Valley News, there was a column uh, on the page next to the opinion page, which had a, a, a very good uh, argument uh, that this is a problem that they should be trying to, to, to solve many parts to solving this. Uh, we need more childcare, we need more preschool, we need living wages, health insurance, job training, uh, diverse hiring practices, and so on. Uh, will businesses support these programs that's certainly gonna add costs to their bottom line? Or will they look at it differently, and see how much it costs if those protections are not available? Science. Collaborations rule, they rule the day and I think science has been changed. Scientists from China have mapped the, they mapped the viral genome and they provided it to scientists and pharmaceutical companies across the globe. The possible vaccines were created in weeks rather than years. I, initially is over hundred vaccines or, or candidate vaccines were, were created in a matter of weeks. Never, ever before has this kind of speed been possible. Clinical trials with global recruitment were underway in months. Imagine the complexity of trying to manage data sets with, with people from uh, across the nations and across the across nations and across oceans. Um, licenses and, and emergency use authorizations were granted in less than one year. And vaccinations were underway in about a year. Now this was unprecedented speed without cutting corners, but it gave a, a, a bad look to a lot of people. They, they said, how can it possibly be something that took decades? It's now taking a year. Uh, somebody's playing around and we are all guinea pigs. Well, that is not the case. 
uh, much of the work that, that uh, went into the vaccinations had been ongoing for a decade or more, uh, but it was at a point where they could, they could speed it up um, as they did. Under the pressure of COVID, Science has demonstrated the following, the ability to move faster. Findings were shared online and rigor was maintained by exceptional coordination across borders. Science can be more accessible. Virtual meetings enabled more researchers to meet and directly discuss issues with others. Science can be more direct. Scientists and bloggers grew large following as they explained to the public what was happening and why. Uh, one scientist said, I had yeah, maybe a few dozen people who, who used to listen to me. Now I've got 79,000. Become more, science has become more unified. Researchers around the globe collaborated. Those in other fields pivoted and joined the battle against COVID. Uh, we found that science is not diverse. Women were participating in less research. The number of women in COVID related uh, uh, publications was was diminished, and this was probably because women are are more likely to be the caregiver for the children at home. Uh, so moves are underway to support increased diversity. And also, science is a human endeavor. This is done by humans who are living human lives, and yet they're capable of great achievements. They're also capable of errors uh, or missteps, uh, whatever word you want to use. Um, th these are not uh, super people, um, and, and you know I think it's been good that uh, the, the humanity of scientists has started to shine through. There are many universities that are now establishing multidisciplinary institutes, to bring diverse domains together. I'm familiar with what's going on at, at Yale, but it, it is not limited to Yale by any stretch. They've moved its data sciences faculty from the computer sciences department to its science center to promote work with and between biology, chemistry, and physics. It's also now closer to the business school, which has formal collaborations with the medical and public health school. They're also moving all of the humanities departments together for cross-pollination of ideas and to create new lines of research and understanding. And they're also doing as much as possible to promote more collaboration between the humanities and the science. I think this is happening everywhere. Stanford is doing it, Harvard is doing it, uh, and the, the, the frontier, the, the second tier and the third tier schools are all looking at this model. And, and many of them are actively engaged in reorganizing uh, their, their research and their Medicine, the rise of telehealth is a huge, huge piece uh, of the impact of COVID. And I think that telehealth is here to stay. Uh, office visits are becoming less common. People do not want to go to the doctor's offices or go to the, the, uh, um, the hospital for fear of, of catching COVID there. Diagnoses, prescription histories can all be uh, done digitally. We have small wearable devices that can monitor body activities and send the data to the physician's office. Um, I, I know that, uh, let's see, for chronic pain, uh, there was just something I read this morning about, um, uh, and this, this kind of was illustrated, this problem was illustrated uh, when Texas froze over uh, a few months ago. Uh, people could not um, refill their, their pain medication um, and they could not go to the hospital. One, one person was, was forced to go to the hospital that had no recourse in order to redo her prescription and also to be seen. It was a two hours drive on ice and two hours back on ice. So she risked quite a bit to do this. Um, now, what they're finding is that uh, chronic pain consultations are actually uh, preferred by many people who have this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have to deal with the, you know, being able to have a built-in 
uh, resupply available uh, of our of our our, uh, our medication. I think the focus of medicine will move slowly, but move from treatment to prevention. I think we're going to have government managed health systems um, that will increase payments for prevention. Medicaid expansion, Medicare expansion will be possible in this administration, I believe, um, if it has that, that opportunity and is voted through uh, in, the, uh, in the Congress. And I, there is also increased support for public health and prevention services that's also more possible with this administration. COVID has also shown that we're far further along with artificial intelligence than we realize. Artificial intelligence can do remarkable things. You can do literature searches for physicians. You can analyze millions of pages of published data and thousands of studies and summarize them within minutes for a doctor to consider what the next options might be. The abilities to help in diagnoses are, are going to increase our focus on care. Uh, they can provide AI can provide dietary and behavior change information and help to act as coaches. We're seeing a rise of robotics that's going to create a new division of labor between machines and clinicians. So many, so many um, surgeries are really done by machine uh, with the, the doctor guiding the machine. But medical technology is going to require more software as well as hardware sophistication among its workforce. And we'll probably talk about this again. The power of medicine has been on display with unprecedented collaboration. Uh, you know, unraveling the secret of clinical COVID, looking at treatment regimens, the epidemiology of the disease, prevention and control strategies across international boundaries. All of this because of collaborations and our abilities to share data. New test kits are being created with amazing speed. And this is actually akin to a Manhattan project. project. Uh, developing these new test kits. And we're, we're establishing this game plan for how to use big data and artificial intelligence. This is going to be a huge gain in our capacity. Finally, genetic sequencing is going to become routine and will be behind, I think, major advances in medicine and public health. We've seen how sequencing helped create the COVID vaccines, identifying viral variants, and it's creating a new branch of epidemiology, genetic epidemiology. Sequencing, uh, you know, now a, a nod to the genetic epidemiologists, uh, we can definitively identify at the DNA level uh, whether this case is related to that case. Uh, the, the distinctions are going to be so precise now in, in investigating outbreaks as well as dealing with the pandemic. Sequencing is going to be at the core of cancer and other disease research and treatment. And we are heading, uh, this is uh, not my prediction, uh, but we are heading towards more personalized medicine. Uh, medicines and treatment regimens that are created on the basis of your genome and the genome of the, the whatever the condition is that's afflicting you. Kind of a brave new world. You know, it, it, with education, it seemed kind of sad, but there was more urgency about reopening bars than there was reopening school. People were taken to the streets because they couldn't go to their tavern. Uh, the discussion was about schools. You know, it was always, is it safe to be in school? I think the discussion could have been and should have been, how can we make it safe? You know, we need vaccines. We need ventilation studies. We need social distancing, masks, testing, uh, virtual education for those in quarantine or cannot be in group settings. We need to have transportation services, protocols for activities, uh, preschool opportunities, uh, all call for government support to assure these possibilities. Uh, the mental health experience has shown how powerful personal interactions are for people. And the, the, uh, the personal interaction, the in-person education is showing itself to be a huge part of better educational outcomes. 
Manufacturing. I hope we have seen the failure of offshoring our manufacturing. It's a huge mistake. You know, the idea of just-in-time manufacturing and just-in-time supply chain. You can't do that when you've got a, a, a pandemic, which is an economic as well as a national security hazard. This is not going to be, manufacturing is not going to be like it was in the 1950s. It's highly mechanized, it's run by software, and it's basically creating products that are made by machines to create more products. Um, it's gonna require an upgrade on technical training of those designing and overseeing these processes. And robotics is gonna decrease the on-the-job injury. Um, we will have very, many fewer people working in manufacturing those people are going to be more highly trained uh, and require much greater uh, technical uh, education. I am hoping we've relearned the World War II lesson of multiple uses of manufacturing capacity. Uh, in the Second World War, the GM, Ford, Chrysler, they all turned their, their, uh, their automatic, I'm sorry, the automobile line into lines creating uh, parts for weapons or tanks, for example. The GM turned one of their auto plants in Indiana into a ventilator plant, uh, producing thousands per month. Uh, our, one of our own Vermont distillers uh, began producing its, its hand sanitizer, uh, its own hand sanitizer, uh, after setting aside its, its bourbon and, uh, and uh, vodka distilling. But they were able to use the same machinery. And there are many other examples of how the manufacturers take advantage of their ability to be flexible. A few words on climate change. Uh, climate change uh, may have played a role in COVID emergence. Uh, where did, where did SARS-CoV-2 virus come from and, and why now? Uh, research in China and elsewhere in Asia points to bats as reservoirs of COVID-2 and other coronaviruses. Uh, that part is less controversial as to how exactly did this virus arrive. But there, there used to be large areas that were tropical shrubland in China that are now savannas and tropical forests. This provides a favorable habitat for a majority of bat species. So we've seen a, a vast increase in the numbers of bats, numbers of uh, not not, not an increase in the bat species, but the numbers in bats which promotes them as a food source, which promotes the, the contact with humans and thus possibly enabling the viruses to cross the species barrier. Uh, this remains to be confirmed by additional research, but it, it makes sense. Well, I'm also a timekeeper, it's one o'clock. Oh my gosh, oh my <laughs> goodness. Thank you so much, all right, so uh, if we had time, uh, this shows between 1901 and 1930 what the land in central China looked like and now how it's changed with uh, climate change. All right. Um, it's not clear whether COVID-19 has had any impact on climate change. Uh, so, um, you know, yes, the, the skies are green, uh, sorry, the skies are blue, uh, our pollution is down. But uh, uh, you know, once once we go back to the way things used to be, I think our, our manufacturing uh, smokestacks are going to start spewing out more smoke, et cetera, and we're going to be using more gasoline for our cars. So I, I, I don't think there's a long-term impact. Communication, social media has weaponized our information with misinformation and disinformation. This has antagonized the political right and the political left. Both want more controls over big tech, but perhaps for different reasons. Uh, social media has also hollowed out our press, uh, weakening independent oversight of government at all levels. I think we can expect to have hearings and legislation and perhaps lawsuits over content uh, with this. This is a very serious uh, issue that has great public health uh, impact. Uh, globalization, the world is increasingly connected. Uh, important for trade, travel, et cetera, is, uh, is evident. Nationalism cannot address these, these realities. 
Uh, on the corporate level, I think the big companies are going to succeed and they're going to get bigger. You have greater access to global trade, bank funding, lines of credit. We've got stronger supply chains. Uh, and they can afford losses on some of their fronts to enjoy greater advantages on others. They can also are, are more capable of using big data for innovation and see opportunities where smaller businesses may not be able to see them. On a global scale, we're seeing increasing competition between the US and China. The previous administration spent four years trying to pull back from the world. And China spent those four years stepping into the vacuum we created. And now we're trying to reassert ourselves, but it's an uphill climb. Uh, we are in a uh, in, intensifying era of competition with China. And Fareed Zakaria, who I think is a very, uh, very wise political commentator, says a Cold War could be a choice. Personally, I think this administration is going to do whatever it can to avoid this. Digitalization, vaccines were developed at record speeds. Tech enabled remote school and work. We kept millions fed, clothed, entertained. It's unbelievable. Um, it's estimated, Time Magazine had an article that uh, estimated that COVID advanced the workplace digitalization by five years. Everything that could be digitalized was. All businesses now in some form are a tech business. Uh, robotics is changing the workplace. I talked about that with manufacturing processes, etc. We're going to need massive training programs needed for this job displacement. So here's two, two views of, of Amazon warehouses. Uh, each of them employ maybe about 1,500 people. Uh, and you just look at the technology uh, that's involved, uh, it's, you know, over, it's, looking at the one on, on your left, it, it looks like the, the warehouse from uh, the end of, of the Indiana Jones movie, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, and the one on the right, look at all the technology this person is, uh, is trying to deal with in, in packing, shipping, and, um, and well, packing and shipping the whatever is being sold. So making this happen, happen, pandemics lay bare our social divides. Frontline workers were hailed and praised early on, but not now. And many have been hassled and threatened when doing their job, when they try to enforce their uh, mask uh, requirements. And economic divides and the risks of disproportionate poor health, social and financial outcomes is only going to increase over time without government uh, intervention and economic policies that provide a, an appropriate social safety net. Uh, there's a long list of what needs to be done. There needs to be governmental responses, business responses. Science literacy needs to rebuilt, be rebuilt through education. Medicine, we need to have a greater access to medical care. And this involves, among other things, insurance that covers prevention as well as covering our, our illnesses. Uh, education, we have to improve on our critical thinking. Uh, restore civics education, it's, it's my thought. Uh, pre-K and summer programs I think are essential and we need pathway to skills for this generation and the next generation job. Climate change, this is an existential issue. It has to be dealt with. Otherwise, the rest of this is meaningless. Communication, we have to deal with the freedom of speech issues. Uh, globalization, we have to reduce the cheating and unfair advantages when governments take an active role in an active partnership with their businesses. And digitalization is also uh, something that we have to uh, deal with. We need education and training, access to living wage jobs. Uh, and I think finally, uh, again, uh, going back to Fareed Zakaria, Inequality may be inevitable, but in the most fundamental moral sense, all human beings are equal. And I think we have to look at that and have that as a, perhaps our, our North Star. So I'm so sorry that uh, we've gone over. I've got one, I have one question for you. Okay. Okay. Um, we're beginning to hear about fully vaccinated people testing positive for COVID-19. Yes. 
multiple coaches on the Yankees, for example, and yesterday Bill Mayer, should we expect that to happen with increasing frequency as the populace is encouraged to demask in supposedly safe situations? I think we can expect it to continue happening. Um, it, it's, it's really, I wrote this down. Uh, uh, let's see, 117 in the US, 117 million fully vaccinated and 9,245 who have had breakthrough infections or illnesses. Those their infections, the illnesses are less severe. There's less need for hospitalization. There's, I'm not sure how many fatalities, but I think if there are, there is a handful. So um, I think when you're immunizing vast numbers of people, you're gonna start getting these. Uh, and but again, this is kind of a risk tolerance question. And this is 0.08% have had, uh, when I talked about the 117 full million versus the 9,000. Um, are we willing to accept that? And if we're willing, I, I think most people would, would say yes, especially if it, it seems that if they're, if they're receiving the, if they're becoming sick, they're not that sick, and they're also less likely to transmit because of their immunization. So I, I think that societally, we will accept this risk. Okay, let's see, one more question here. Um, as the world warms, melting the glaciers, are diseases being uncovered that have been under the ice for centuries? I haven't heard of that. It's an interesting thought. Um, I, I haven't heard of that, but um, certainly as the climate changes, you have opportunities such as I talked about the bats. Um, and particularly what's of concern is the expansion of, of um, uh, oh, mosquito populations. Uh, going from the warmer areas of the world into the more temperate areas of the world because the more temperate areas are warming up and they're becoming more tropical uh, and they're able to support uh, disease, I'm sorry, if, uh, mosquito species that are capable of transmitting things like dengue, yellow fever, malaria, and Zika virus. So uh, as things warm up, the diseases of the tropics may become more common in the temperate areas because of uh, these, uh, the, the warmth. Um, I, I haven't heard of, of ancient bugs uh, that are thawing out uh, becoming a problem. But who knows? It's a, it's a very interesting thought. Okay, that is all the questions that we have. Um, and uh, I want to thank Paul. We did get a comment, a thank you comment for your thought provoking presentation. Um, and we hope that people have uh, enjoyed this series. Um, and we, as we said, appreciate your feedback and we appreciate you attending. So thank you much, very much for coming and um, we'll let you know when we got the next things planned. And again, I will get back to people um, with the link uh, for all the talks. Uh, um, I'll send it out on the listserv and I'll have Lori send it out as well with the next highlights. Okay. And I think that it looks like is it. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the warm weather. Bye-bye. Thank you. Everybody.